Welcome back. It's been a while, as usual. Uh, I've got 60 hours on the airframe now, so well beyond phase one into phase two. Had a chance to take passengers. Lots of fun flying times with my buddies. We'll get to those, but first I want to get this build update out of the way. Fill everybody in on what I've completed uh, since the last video. Some of the things I still need to do. And then, of course, at the end, I get a lot of questions about performance and what I'm seeing for performance based on the engine prop combination. We'll do that uh, towards the end. Uh, I have some sort of numbers that uh, I've got ballparked based on my phase one testing, but it's still sort of an a ongoing discovery process, and I still have a few sort of modifications to do to try and get a little better performance, but we'll get to that at the end. So anyway, without further ado, let's get started. Talk about my alternator issue that I had when I first started flying. So one of the things I was noticing is that I wasn't getting, my battery was basically discharging constantly. And the way that you actually show uh, basic voltage in the airplane was a little confusing to me at first. So I'm going to walk through what I did to sort of diagnose some issues that I had and ended up fixing something that was uh, kind of annoying, but we got it up and running. First things first, I'm going to go ahead and boot into the configuration menu for the G3X, which is just hold the menu button, hit the master switch, and it'll start to fire up. As soon as it starts to say configuration mode, I can let, let, let go of this button. Come on now. Okay, so it's configuration mode. First things first, my master and avionics switch, switches were switched from the factory, so I had to go through and rewire those. I don't know why I didn't notice that at first, but you know, you get around to things when you get around to things. Brandon helped me diagnose why that problem was happening, but basically every time I hit my master switch, or I had to turn my avionics switch on to run the fuel pumps, which didn't make sense to me, and uh, my master solenoid, I could hear when I hit my avionics switch, so they were backwards, but switched them, no big deal. Once I did that, I thought that might have, have something to do with my voltage problem, but let me talk about how you actually read voltage. So if you go into the engine options and uh, you go down to volts one, the way I have this set up is it's EIS power input volts. And this tells you how much power is going into the actual G3X. So it's displayed down in the bottom. This says 13.2 right now, which is down in the corner there. That is, again, what the G3X is reading. So right now, since there's no alternator running, it's reading directly off of the battery. You want it to show, basically when the alternator kicks on, this will start reading alternator voltage because that'll be the dominant voltage that's going into the actual system. So what I was noticing is that this, I would charge it because it kept dying on me. I would charge it overnight and I'd come back, so it'd be at 13.8, and then I'd go and run the engine and it would stay up at 13.8 and then start dropping, 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 and it would come back up and then it'd start dropping, dropping, dropping. So I had intermittent, basically, voltage on the system. I could hear weird sounds in the headset and I couldn't figure out what was going on. What should happen, this is what should happen, when you fire up these IS engines, it does not initially give you uh, power off of the alternator. You first run off a battery and all of your power comes off of regulator B. So for the first, I think, 15 seconds or whatever, you're running off a battery then you have to actually run the engine up above 24 or 2500 RPM. Then it'll kick on regulator B and you should start showing 14 volts here on the system. I wasn't getting that. Uh, I was getting intermittent voltage and I could not figure out why. It was a very simple fix though. The lead to this alternator circuit breaker on the top end was just slightly loose. And so I'd get power sometimes and then not power other, other times. So I basically just tightened that down and it solved the problem. So now when I fire up the engine, you know, you get, it shows battery voltage for a little bit and then it comes up and uh, stabilizes at 14 volts. So that was a simple fix. One other thing I'll talk about in here is, Harlan asked me about this today, the coolant temperature. There, there are no CH cylinder head temperature gauges on these engines uh, because it's water cooled. So you have to set up one coolant temp, which is your basically your, your fluid or water temp. And that uh, comes right off the Rotax FADEC. And then, let's see, go back. The Cavlico fuel pressure sensor, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't able to get differential pressure. The IS engines need to read fuel pressure over airbox pressure, and that's how you get your actual uh, displayed fuel pressure. I couldn't get it to be a differential. I kept ta calling Dean down at Lockwood, and like, why isn't it showing? What I was doing wrong was you actually have to turn on the manifold pressure from the FADEX and get it to be pulling into the Garmin. Once this is on, which it says show, you just basically select Rotax FADEX there. Once you get that to show, then you can go into the fuel pressure sensor and it'll say pressure reference. You can do normal or manifold pressure and you set it up for manifold pressure and then configure it accordingly. So that took me a little while to figure out, but that's just sort of a little gotcha that uh, was taken care of. So that's all I have for sort of G3X configuration. I have it set up, you know, manifold pressure, RPM, gallons per hour, oil pressure. It, it sets the order on these for you. So if you select something, it just sort of puts it in order. 
Uh, and I just basically want to show that voltage number so I know if I'm getting ship power or not. <sighs> okay, we'll turn that off. That's all I have for that. And I'll transition right into some things I still need to do in the plane. So this uh, skylight attachment angle, the glue popped off, which is a common problem with high saw. Lauren said his popped. It's a very common thing. If you watch a bunch of videos, you'll see guys, they just don't even reattach them. They're just free floating. I'm gonna come back and reattach this. You can see where my experimental logo cracked along the seam there. So it's mostly an experimental logo. But this is one of the things I have to go through and uh, reattach, which I'm gonna do next week, just sort of get it glued back down. Another thing while I'm up here, these wing root fairings had a big gap in them. So there was a lot of air blowing through and if it was raining slightly, it'd come in and hit you right in the face. So I went in and put an actual piece of weather stripping in there to stop the airflow. And I bent them downward I just bent the aluminum down so that it's sealed off and we have a good, nice, tight fit. So those are two things that I have fixed since then. I also have this, I guess I kind of forgot about this, but this right stick is removed and I have a sort of a quick connect on the, it's just a Deutsch connector for the actual push to talk. So I can pull this out, put it back in. It's one bolt and one plug and uh, we're good to go. So I think that's all I've got for uh, updates in the cockpit. Everything else is fine, fine. I'll show you guys some video being in here, so. That's it. So this is the front view of the wing root cover. I'm not, this isn't my most aesthetically pleasing piece in the world. I could have done a better job with this, but it was so far at the end and I really just didn't care about it that it was a little sloppy, but at least it's, it's airtight now. I put weather stripping on the backside of that in there and then I bent the actual piece down closer to this butt rib closeout so that it seals off the airflow going through and now I don't have water or air coming through that gap. The other thing I'll talk about while I'm up here is I put, this is the same uh, foam tape that I used to seal the windshield. I ended up running a strip down on this second, or I guess it's the first false rib on the wing because while my door opens all the way up, it, on the ground, it doesn't touch, it's got clearance, but in flight, this has pressure on it. So it pushes up and it pushes right up into that rib. It ended up rubbing right here and there was like a little bit of, not scratching, but yeah, I guess you call it scratching on the windshield or the, the bubble door. So what I did, I put that foam strip up there and now I can open this in flight and it pushes up against there and it doesn't have any problem rubbing up against that rib. So just a sort of a little thing that was helpful. I do have these doors set up to be removable, but I, you know, can just open them in flight. I don't have to remove them. So this, this works for now. Moving on. I did end up putting vortex generators on the tail. These are the ones that were provided from Kitfox. I don't like them. You have to like individually put tape and trim them. And um, I looked to see if I could find replacements for them and they're nowhere available online. So that means the only place you could get them from is probably Kitfox. I ended up just buying for the rest of the plane. I bought Stoll Speed VGs, much easier to work with, like a lot easier to work with. It's one of the sort of the industry standard for VGs. So it's easy to find parts and get them from aircraft spruce. But these I just put on uh, the tighter spacing. I can't remember what it is, 30 millimeter or something like that. Very difficult to get down here. And I just used the 3M, I guess it's VHB tape that I use for the doors and tacked them on there. They haven't come off. It did help with my performance a little bit, but it increased my stall speed, which seems a little odd. But either way, they definitely help. You can actually pull it into a stall rather than having it sort of like mush into a stall. So it's a much more intentional control over the actual plane. So these are done. I will be doing the wing VGs and seeing how that affects my performance. Uh, but it's just, I have to paint him. It's a, it's a big undertaking. So I'll be doing that next week. So stay posted. Okay, so that pretty much covers all the things that I've done with the exception of the oil change and the prop, which I'll start talking about now. This is the maintenance schedule, which comes directly from the Rotax maintenance manual. The way I get these is uh, go to rotaxowner.com and you just click on the 9, whatever engine you have. If it's a 912 IS or 915, you go ahead and pull the maintenance manual. And this one's in chapter 5-20-00. This has all the operating intervals. So there's the initial 25 hour check when you first overhaul or put an engine in service. And that's basically 100 hour with the exception of a full on oil change. I went at 50 hours, I did a 100 hour inspection. That involves basically pulling spark plugs, replacing filters, changing the oil, pulling the magnetic plug. You just basically go down the list and check off what it is that you need to do for that uh, inspection. One thing I haven't done is I don't have a, what's called a, I think it's called a buds dongle, which allows you to actually boot into the ECU and get the fault codes and things like that. I'll go down to Lockwood and actually get that pulled off the airplane at some point in time and have that on file somewhere. But this was, you know, go through the sort of the oil change and, and get it done and then sign it off. And then I actually made an entry in my logbook 
that says I completed my 100 hour inspection. So I actually did through, go through the actual full 100 hour inspection at my 50 hour mark and everything's good. The spark plugs were horrendously dirty and well, actually they weren't that bad, but they're pretty dirty and the oil was pretty dark. I think you can optionally do 100 hour oil changes. I don't burn 100 low lead, so you don't have to do the 50 hour ones, but I think I'm just gonna do 50 hour spark plug and oil changes because that seems to be what most people do, I guess in general. And a filter is not that expensive. If you buy the NGK plugs, it's not very expensive. So it's good to just sort of keep up on that and uh, stay ahead of it. Just because it says you can do it in 100 hours, I mean, I feel like 50 hours is not that big of a difference. So that is something that I have gotten done. Transitioning into the propeller. This propeller I've been fiddling around with and trying to get different settings for different performance. Right now it's set in my climb performance and I'll pull my performance numbers and talk about what exactly I'm getting under this setting versus my cruise performance or cruise prop setting that I had set up. Before I get to that, a few lingering things that I actually have to do left on the airframe. I need to put my stall fences on, which need to be reshaped and repainted. And I also need to go through and touch up paint things like the cowling because I had to open this slot from a previous video. I talked about that for cooling. And I had to go through and touch up and reinforce that. And I'll do those at the same time because those both have the that's not the polyfiber paint, whatever the other aerothane paint is called. Going into the prop and performance, let me grab my performance numbers quickly. So based off this prop setting, I'm not full on max climb. I'm basically set to what I would consider what at the most I want a pitch for climb and also still be a reasonably performing airplane. My static RPM on the ground is about 5650 RPM. And this right now, gets me a top speed of 76 knots, which is 87 miles per hour. So not very fast. My takeoff roll with no passengers and full fuel is about 300 feet on grass. Now, if I go on the pavement, it's a little less, but if I'm on the grass, obviously it adds a little bit of drag. And I'm, my takeoff roll is about 300 feet and to get over a 50 foot obstacle is about 500 feet. I like to have a thousand feet of runway to feel confident about it. And that's not a thousand feet of runway, but a thousand feet of area with no obstacles. So a thousand feet from 50 foot obstacle to 50 foot obstacle. But other than that, I mean, in those scenarios, it performs great. If you throw a person in there, basically it increases my takeoff roll by about 100 feet. So we're doing about 400 feet and it's about 600 feet over a 50 foot obstacle. Then when I actually put it into a climb, initially I do like 1100 or probably 1200 feet per minute. It'll actually stabilize after probably maybe 30 seconds of climbing. It'll stabilize at about 750 feet per minute with this prop setting. That's all, you know, firewall, Slam to the firewall, full power, and my climb speed is about 41 knots. I believe that's my VX and VY. I think they're about the same. I have to double check, but uh, this is what I have written down for now. Again, top speed on this is pretty slow. We're doing 87 miles an hour or 76 knots with this climb prop setting. I could shorten my takeoff roll, but I'm already down to 87 miles per hour, which is slow. I mean, there are cars that pass me on the highway at this point when I go down Highway 60. So uh, this is enough for me. It's plenty of performance for going around here and all the places where I'm gonna go, it's definitely good enough. And we are at sea level here, we're at like 200 feet. So there's altitude's not really a consideration. The cruise prop setting, which is, it's amazing how close the angles are. I mean, it's probably only about two or three degrees difference. My static RPM on the ground is about 5,500 RPM. And that yields a takeoff roll of about 600 feet on grass. It's probably about 400 feet on pavement which is still pretty short, but it's nowhere near the, the takeoff roll of, of the climb prop. I mean, you can definitely feel the difference with this pitch this way. It's like you get slammed to the back of your feet. So climb with this prop setting is about 600 feet per minute continuous. Obviously, right when you pull off the ground, you get you know an 800, 900 feet per minute for about 30 seconds, and then it goes and stabilizes about 600, 650 feet per minute. And then the cruise speed is 95 knots with the cruise setting, sorry, 95 miles an hour, which is 82 knots. So cruise speed is 95 miles an hour with the cruise setting. Now again, I could even pitch that steeper and get probably, if I had to guess, I could probably get 100 knots out of this thing. Sorry, not 100 knots, let me rephrase. I could probably get 100 miles per hour out of this thing, but it's kind of one of those things where once you get into that pitch setting, the takeoff roll gets really long and you can tell the difference. I've been flying with some people who weigh 200 plus pounds and it really does sort of turn into a hog when you're pitched that steep, so. Anyway, the last two sort of performance considerations are my stall speed. So without VGs, I was stalling at about 41 miles per hour. That was light. And uh, with the VGs, I'm at 42 miles per hour. This is with just myself and about half tanks. 
now that I put the VGs, we're at 42 miles an hour, which is about 35 knots. That's with the aircraft, you know, at like 1,200 pounds. With full fuel and another 200 pound passenger, it ends up stalling at like probably 40 something knots, which is in the 50 mile an hour range. Uh, that's, that's dirty, so with full flaps. So anyways, stall speed is, like it's higher than a Super Cub, but it still is pretty darn slow. One of the things that's great about these flaperons is you can f control well into the stall. So you have really good aileron authority all the way into those, those slow speeds like that. Those are the uh, basic performance numbers that I have. Uh, I'm gonna try a few more prop settings to see what other performance I can get out of it. One of the big things that I'm 100% considering is a constant speed prop. I now understand why people can justify it. It basically will give me all the time my full horsepower on the ground, and then it'll allow me to max speed out in the air without having to repitch every time. It takes me about 15 to 20 minutes to repitch this thing, and uh, because it's two, four, six, eight, ten bolts. There's a Duke has a propeller that I don't like because it doesn't look very nice that has like a single Allen key that allows you to switch between pitches on the ground. That's a sort of intermediate option that would help at least repitch it quickly, but it's ex it's not as expensive as a constant speed. If I was gonna do it right, I'd just put a constant speed on there, electric uh, air master or something like that. Anyway, those are the thoughts on aircraft performance. So anyway, that yeah, if anybody has any questions, let me know. Okay, that wraps up this build update. Pretty much nothing left to do. So these build updates are pretty much done. That's 27 of them or something like that. So thanks for sticking with me this whole time. Hope this is a useful resource for those of you who are working on these or thinking about buying them. I have some videos in the works that are not build specific. So we're gonna start moving into some sweet flying footage. So stay tuned for that. I'll get those up sometime soon here. No promises. So anyway, thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.